Hey you guys, Matt Allen here. Welcome back to Tactical Bass and today we are talking about one of the most overlooked categories of baits in bass fishing. We're talking about metal baits and how to use them to catch fish this time of year. Metal baits, whether that is a spoon, you know, a jigging spoon or a flutter spoon, whether that is a tailspin or a blade bait, this entire category for the most part is completely misunderstood and overlooked by the vast majority of bass anglers. Metal baits need to be in your arsenal during the fall to winter transition and all the way through winter. Now we've been doing a lot of deep dive videos lately, down the rabbit hole, full seminars, you know, swim baits, crank baits, whether that's square bill or speed cranking, jigs, jerk baits, covering those key subjects that you need to understand. Well, metal baits fit right in there too, and they fit in sort of a funny niche. The metal bait can be both a reaction bite and a finesse bite, depending on how you present it, but they work in times and places where the other baits don't. I think that's why they're so misunderstood. Guys look at, you know, a big hunk of lead. That's a one and three quarter ounce spoon right there. Guys look at that and they're like, I don't even know how to fish with that thing. You throw it out there and wind it back, you know, what do you even do with it? Flutter spoons, at least we see guys throwing them in the summertime. So we've got a little bit of an understanding there, but tail spins and blade baits, all bets are off. Today, we're gonna straighten all that out. The value of metal baits, for me, is using them as a reaction bait at depths and at times when the other baits won't work. So jerk baits, speed cranking, those are fantastic ways to draw a core feed response out of a bass. Same with an A-rig. These baits work so well at triggering fish that don't wanna bite, but there's a depth limit. That jerk bait, we're not getting past, you know, 10, 12, 14 feet of water, period. Uh, the tactical DD, even the duo, which goes a lot deeper, we're not getting past the 20 foot mark realistically. So what do you do if you're a reservoir guy and your fish are sitting in 30 or 40 or even 50 foot? You're limited to finesse fishing, right? You're out there drop shot and Ned rigging unless you understand how to use metal baits. Now it's not just for that application. There are a ton of shallow water applications as well. And we're going to cover all that. Be it when storms roll in, you get a flow of muddy water and all of a sudden a tailspin will outfish a Kitek or it's just a really good crisp cold morning and that blade bait bite is going. It can be going in a foot of water. It can be going in 30 feet of water. These are very effective ways to catch fish. So. I've broken it up. We've got blade baits, tail spins, and spoons. Let's talk about them individually because they're very different and the times and the places we'll throw them are very different. Uh, let's, let's start with blade baits. Um, blade baits are probably the one you're most familiar with. A blade bait is very, very simple. Think of it like a lipless crankbait, only it's made out of stamped metal so there's no rattle in there there's no anything it's just a stamped metal with weight on it okay but other than that it is a lipless crankbait now these two happen to be my favorite this one is from Demiki. this one is from mega bass this is the dyna response this is the vault both of these baits are proven. They're very, very different, however, and on any given day, one or the other is the deal. So I will not go out in wintertime without both. Like, I grabbed my vault box just to show you how serious we are about this. That's a box of vaults, Damiki vault. We are not playing around with these things. These are an important part of my fall and winter arsenal. So the blade bait, the way you're going to fish this is bottom hopping, just like, you guys see that boil right there? Huh? Crazy. If that happens again, we might try and catch him. The blade bait is going to work 
by bottom hopping. So the way I like to fish it is this guy right here. This is my favorite blade bait and tail spin rod. Shimano X Pride 72 Medium Light. Also happens to be my bait finesse flipping rod. But this is hands down. It's not the only rod that you can throw a blade bait on by any means, but it is hands down my favorite rod for throwing a blade. Uh, just the way it loads up in the tip section, it works those baits really well. I can flutter them really well. And then my hookup is great. Hookup to land ratio is excellent. That is hands down my favorite rod for fishing, both a blade and a tailspin. But the way we're gonna fish this, if my fish are relatively shallow, especially low light, sometimes those fish are a little bit more aggressive this time of year. I catch a lot of my biggest fish early and late in the day, particularly early in the day. Take that blade bait, throw it up shallow, and then all you do is just lift that rod until you feel it start to flutter. That bait will kick a little bit. As Soon as it starts to kick, you just stop, and it'll pendulum back to bottom. So pull it up, reel down as it pendulums. Pull it up, that's it. Now one of two things will happen depending on the fish's mood. They may crush it. You may lift up and it just goes boom. Sometimes they are some of the most violent strikes of the entire winter. Other times you'll go to lift again and there's a fish on it. So you'll lift, pendulum, lift, pendulum and you go to lift and there's just weight and you just sort of lean back on it just depends on the fish's mood whether they're crushing it as it's falling or they're just sort of picking it up right when it hits the bottom now as far as the two different styles of bait the Demiki is much more aggressive so you can really feel that vibration when you pull i mean that thing is thumping on your rod tip the dyna response See how it's got all this fluff? Now this one I actually trimmed a little bit. Here's a stock one. I was playing one day. See all this fluff? The more fluff that's on there, the more muted the vibration. So you won't feel as much vibration. Some days they want that thing shimmying. That's when I throw the vault. Sometimes I want it subtle, just a little vibration. That's when I throw the Dyna response. Both, again, I cannot say this enough, both are incredible. If you are going to try this method of fishing, both should be in your lineup. I have caught giants on both so many times. Now, one thing I will say is with any blade bait, I don't care who makes it, what brand, does not matter, I upgrade a lot of my hardware. On the Dyna response, the only thing I change is that snap on the top. See, this one's been upgraded. Number three hyperwire changed out there on the top. On the vault, truthfully, I change it all. All of it. Uh, in the video description, rather than trying to tell you what I do, because it's pretty specific, rather than trying to explain it to you in the video description, you know, we link all the baits, the gear, all that stuff below the video depending on the platform you're on, whether you're watching this on YouTube or our website or Facebook, down below there's a description with links to all the things. But on YouTube, you might have to go down and hit more, scroll down, hit more again. You might have to hit the three little dots to the side of your screen, just depends on what device and what platform. But no matter where you see this video, there is a description with all the links for you below the video. So I'll give you all this stuff for that vault. But either way, once you've got your upgrades done, and the reason why I do that is because the blade bait truly will catch giants. Now again, we can do this right on the bank, right? Throw it right up shallow on say a muddy or a rocky bottom and flutter it out of there. Now, am I gonna get some snags? Yes, I am. I own a good lure retriever and I go get them back out when I need to. It's too effective not to fish it in and around cover and you just deal with the snags. But a lot of times in the winter, I'm also using this technique deep. Main lake points, island tops, those are the places I like to do it. A lot of times, not every lake, but on a lot of lakes, that'll be a bare open area. So like a main lake point that runs out into the lake, good taper on the side of it, a lot of times that's gonna be rock or mud. And you can throw that thing out there all day and not snag it up. Well, those fish will sit out on those main lake structures and feed, especially as we get into the winter time. 
pinch points on the lake. If you're looking for a specific place and you don't know where to go on your lake, go down towards your dam, if your lake has a dam, find those first couple of points up from the dam where the lake gets narrower. That might be the entrance into a couple of creeks, the points on those, wherever that lake starts to narrow down. If there's a couple of points right there, that's a great place to start looking. But a blade bait, start up shallow. If they're not there, work your way down deeper. You might be out in 30, 40 feet of water and realize that's where the fish are. Well, now you can do that on every point and repeat that pattern. It is an amazing way to catch them. The next category is tail spins. Tail spins, I've got three of them. And again, I mean, this is my tailspin box. I am not messing around. I throw this stuff a lot, a lot. They're very, very effective tools. The tailspin can be used in even more situations than a blade bait. And despite that, it's even more overlooked by anglers. I know very few people that throw a tailspin. The tailspin is essentially a hunk of lead with a treble hook and a blade on the back, a tail spinner, right? You're trying to imitate a small bait fish. You can fish this a lot of different ways. You can throw this out, let it hit bottom, and then slow roll it like a swim bait. And that can be an amazing way to catch them, particularly after a storm. Like if you've been throwing either an underspin or a 2.8 Kitek, like if you're just a Kitek on a lead head in the winter time and you just like to crawl that thing, if you get some stain in the water from a storm, sometimes they're having trouble finding that bait, you can do the same thing with the tailspin and they'll get it. The cool thing with a tailspin is if you get bumped and they miss it, you can stall it and that bait will start to swim down and then you can kind of play that flutter game just like it's a blade bait, work in that bait and they'll eat it a second time. But the tail spinner is deadly effective. The second way I'm gonna throw it is throwing it, I, I turned around, there's no bluff wall here, I was looking for a bluff wall, sheer bluff wall. Okay, that's a place that a lot of guys are targeting fish in the winter time. Uh, on a lot of reservoirs, fish will get on the super steep edges of the creeks, those sheer cliff walls or bluff walls. The tailspin is so effective in those places because you can throw it right up against the rock face and then free spool it, and the baits weigh so much that they will fall vertically. They won't pendulum away from the wall. See, if you try to throw a, an eight ounce swim bait up there, it's always going to sort of pull away from the wall. No matter what you do, it's really hard to get it to fall dead straight. The tailspin has so much weight pulling down that it wants to go vertically. So you can work it straight down the face of that wall. And then if you hit bottom, you just give it a little pull six inches, a foot, pull it a little bit off that ledge, because what you're doing is you're stair-stepping down the ledges of the bluffs. The fish, a lot of times, will sit on those ledges or in the holes in the rock, and they'll feed out. And when that thing comes straight down the face of the wall, they grab it. If it's penduluming away from the wall, in all reality, you're nowhere near the fish. That would be like fishing 10 feet over a fish's head on the bottom and wondering why they didn't come up to get it. If you're that far off the wall as your bait's falling away, you're not really fishing. Well, you're fishing, you're not really catching. So the tailspin is an excellent way to fish those vertical structures. Same thing on like bridge pilings where you can throw right up against the concrete and let that thing fall down straight. It's very effective. And then the last way that I fish them is actually exactly like the blade bait. Throw it out. Now, I say exactly, it's not quite exact. You can just pull them and reel up, identical to a blade. But one thing I like to do is throw them out, let them hit the bottom, and then I crank them. Crank, 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 and then stop. So it'll essentially take off swimming up off the bottom, crank, 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 and it'll move like three to five feet. And then I stall, and as soon as I stall, it starts that swim back down. And then it takes off, stalls and falls. And those fish will react to that. That can be really effective before the water gets too cold. Like right now, that can be really effective. The colder we get, the more muted you want your action to get. And we're gonna get to that even more with the spoon. But the colder the water, when that water gets into the 50s 
and then into the 40s. And then depending on where you live in the country, you might get into the mid to high 30s. The colder the water, the more you wanna do almost nothing with that bait. So the blade bait, the tail spin, the spoon, I'm gonna end up just barely moving them in the coldest water. Now where you live, it may never get that cold and you can stay with that aggressive retriever, that fast flutter all the way through winter. You just have to experiment with your fish. Now, as far as types of tail spins, I said I've got three. This is the Jackal Derricoop. By far one of my favorite baits. It's the smallest package, very downsized. Uh, I do, if I'm getting short strikes, I upsize my hook by one size little trick for you. But otherwise, I leave that bait alone. It just has a single hook and they eat it whole. I can't tell you how many times I've seen this thing all the way in the back, in the roof of the mouth, in the mouth of a giant. Two more for you. This is from Damiki, and this one is from Freedom. Similar profiles, different actions, but you can see how much larger these baits are. When do I throw one versus the other? It's all about how large the bait fish are. And if you don't know, start out with the little one. Throw a Derricoop. But if you know that they're chasing bigger bait fish, either you're seeing them spit them out or you're seeing, something just blew up over there too. I haven't seen this many blow ups in a while. Crazy, crazy. Fish pushing back up shallow again. Hmm, mm, mm, mm. I'm getting distracted. All right. So it's size of bait fish. The other thing is that these two, with these larger tail blades, those blades, the rotation of the blade is much larger and it slows the fall even more. So the, the, as that blade is helicoptering behind that bait, it's falling even slower back to the bottom. So it's a little more of a stall out. It's a little bit more subtle. Uh, both of these baits, because they are larger profiles, have an extra hook. So on the Damiki, you've got that main hook. Then you have this double hook right at the front of the blade. It's a very effective. And then on the Freedom, it's a single hook that's actually tucked in the blade. You see that? That is also very, very effective. Both of these baits work extremely well, especially when I'm going deeper and when I wanna be more subtle or when they're chasing bigger bait fish and I'm on that steady retrieve, they are deadly. This blade, sort of an odd shape, it's called a kilter blade. This bait has a little bit more rock to it than the Damiki. The Damiki is more of that subtle willow blade vibration, which is one of my all time, well, I shouldn't say one of, it is my all time favorite vibration of any blade shape is a willow blade, I think. Well, I don't think, I've listened to a lot of sound profiles. Profiles of blades underwater, profiles of bait fish underwater, and I believe that a willow most closely imitates the sound of a threadfin shad underwater. You don't think of blades as having sound, but they do, it's vibration. Vibration is sound. And a willow leaf sounds more like a threadfin shad than any other blade that I have heard. I just have tons of faith in a willow. But that kilter blade is super cool because it's adding a lot of additional vibration and it's very, very unique. That brings us to spoons. Uh, spooning, again, completely misunderstood. A lot of people try to dabble in it, but I think a lot of people get it wrong. Uh, the spoon thing is fascinating. The way fish eat it, the way they fire up and react to it is insane. And that's whether you're throwing a jigging spoon or a flutter spoon. The way fish react to these things is remarkable. Now, not all jigging spoons are created equal. There are a lot of very thin jigging spoons. I don't like them. Uh, I've just never had the consistent success with those fine, profile jigging spoons. It's not to say I haven't caught fish. I've caught plenty of fish, but they never outfish this style of spoon, a fatter bodied spoon. This is a dust spoon. Uh, this guy crushes them. There's no way around it. I have caught more big fish spooning with this spoon in this size 
than probably every other spoon combined. It's remarkable. It's made by Blade Runner. The dust spoon, the two sizes I throw, because they come in a bunch of shapes and a bunch of sizes. The two that I use 99% of the time are the one and three quarter and the three quarter, okay? That is one and three quarter ounces. It doesn't look like it. it's not very big, but it's made of lead, it's solid. So this thing will sink like a bullet, but don't, don't mistake that and think that you should go smaller and lighter. I do way more damage with the one and three quarter than I do with the three quarter. The only time the three quarter comes out is if I see that the shad are really, really small. That's the only time. I will always start with a one and three quarter. This is Morning Dawn. Morning Dawn or Morning Dawn UV. This is the Sierra color. Uh, there's also fried chicken. Those are excellent, excellent colors. I like those bright, bold colors. I like that pink purple, and I like that chartreuse blue. Uh, with the jigging spoon, they're falling so quickly. They're so erratic. I like that bold color to help those fish key in and catch it as it's flying past them. Now, the spooning thing, whether that's a jigging spoon or a flutter spoon, I like to fish these baits vertically or near vertically. In other words, if I see fish on my electronics, I'm on my 2D or maybe I'm idling and I'm side imaging and I see a bait ball and I see that there's fish after them. I'll turn my boat around, drop my trolling motor, get that 2D going or live or whatever. It really does not matter how advanced your electronics are because you wanna be over the top of the fish if you can. Get over the top of them and then I send that spoon straight down and then I hop it. Now, getting a spoon down quickly the trick is to keep a little bit of thumb pressure. So if I take either a jigging spoon or a flutter spoon and I throw it out into deep water on slack line, it'll take all day for that thing to get down because they just find their way to the bottom. But if you keep a little thumb pressure on it, it'll cause that spoon to stand up and then it will sink like a bullet. So you can get down much more quickly if you're thumbing that spool, letting that bait fall straight. Now if the fish are suspended. So I'm in 60 feet of water and I see the fish are 30 feet down. I'm gonna burn that spoon down to like 25-ish feet. Get over the top of their heads and then stop it. And as soon as I stop it, I hop it and then slack. You want it to fall slack. Slack, I can't take it. Slack or semi-slack. Missed them. They pushed to the back. It's all right, we're prepared if this happens again. No such luck. Anyway, you want that thing, we're gonna leave that rod right there, ready for battle. It's the second time that fish did that. So when that bait is down to the depth you want it, again, if they're suspended, I stop above them. If they're on bottom, I go all the way to the bottom. That thing gets down to where I want it. I pull it up, and as soon as I pull it up, I give it slack. Because if I keep it on a tight line, again, it's just going to go vertically, and I don't want that. So I slack it, and as soon as I slack it, the bait will start to do this thing. That's when the fish will hit it. Now the trick with a spoon is that if I go completely slack, they'll smack that thing and I won't even feel it. And obviously when a fish hits this giant hunk of metal, it is not what they were expecting, right? They're expecting a soft bait fish. So they try to get it back out as fast as it went in. They are on and off that thing. So if you're completely slack, they'll be on and off it. You'll feel the dunk, but it's too late. They're not there. So. I go semi-slack and that just takes time. Learn that feel where the bait is still slack but I'm following it down. And that way when I feel that bump, I can immediately stick them. Sounds complicated, it's not. As long as you know you need to be paying attention to how much slack you have out, it'll be really, really simple for you to figure out. Now, sometimes this game is up in the water column above suspended fish, sometimes it's all the way down on the bottom. How do I decide between a jigging spoon and a flutter spoon? 
That's a major deal. And this is my preferred side of flutter, size of flutter spoon in the winter. Sometimes I throw the bigger size, the mini mag, but the vast majority of the time I throw this one, which is why I didn't even bring the mini mag today. If I'm over the top of them, like they're not moving around a lot. So this time of year, let's say I've idled into a, a steep walled cove and those fish are in 40 feet of water in the gut of that cove. Well, then I know where they are and I'm gonna jigging spoon those things until I'm bored. But if I'm on a flat where the bait fish are moving around and thus the bass are moving around with them, then flutter spoon, because the flutter spoon, I can throw it way farther out, let that thing go down. And, and when I work it, it's still very effective. The jigging spoon, I'll throw 20 to 30 feet from the boat and still get great action out of it. But out there on a full cast, it just doesn't, the presentation doesn't look as good as a flutter spoon does. So again, vertical or near vertical, right around the boat, jigging spoon, sending it way out there, flutter spoon. Uh, I do upgrade hardware on these things. I will say the nickels, the flutter spoon, comes with great stuff. I fish it completely stock. The Blade Runner, I do upgrade. Split ring, or I'm sorry, uh, swivel and hook. So on the Blade Runners, an owner ST56, size two for the big one, and a size four on the small one. That allows me to put a lot more pressure on the fish. And then again, I put a swivel on the other end because these things are spinning and turning and twisting. They will wreck a spool of line fast. Uh, but you put a swivel on there and you're good to go. Now, the reason I go to that ST56, which is a 3X treble hook, is because I pull on these fish. When you get bit on a blade bait or a tail spin, that's more like catching them on a crankbait. You just lean back and you keep them loaded up if you've got them on the right rod. That 7.2 ML, that medium light, I cannot say enough good things about this rod. I, I throw them on some of my other rods, my square bill rods or my lipless rod or my jerk bait rod if I have to, if I don't have this rod with me. But if I knew that this was the bite I'm headed to, this rod lands so many of those fish. It's It does such a good job, such a good job. Uh, so I just load up on them and just keep it tight and fight them to the boat. But the spoon is a whole nother animal. When you stick them on the spoon, you need to get those fish in the boat now. There is an ounce and three quarter in front of their mouth flapping. And if they come up head shaking, it's coming out. That's reality. You're going to lose those fish. So I upgrade that hook to a strong hook so that I can just winch those fish. Now, if you're winching fish out of deep water, you gotta put them back right away or they will not be okay. I want you to understand, if you winch one out of 60 feet of water and throw them in your live well, that fish is gonna die. They're gonna have barrow trauma and they are not gonna recover. So if you are winching out of really deep water, return them as quickly as you got them. They will be okay. Don't keep them around in the boat. Uh, if you have to, slow that down, but you are gonna lose some of those fish. Horsing them is how you land those spoonfish. Spooning rods, I'm very specific on what I use. This is a St. Croix, seven, four heavy fast, but it's very soft in the tip section. This is the best, literally the best rod I've ever found to throw the jigging spoon. Soft tip section, stout in the mid so I could still bulldog them and drag them. I fish it on straight 20 pound fluoro. This is not a technique where I'm braid to leader. I like straight fluoro for this. That helps absorb a little bit as I'm making those pops. And then again, I'm winching them. And one thing about this rod that is major for me is that it's a solid handle. You will, doing this all day long, if you're using a split grip, particularly a split grip with like harsh edges, you will tear up, you will bruise up and rough up your side. So I like a full handle for spooning because I'm raking that thing up my side all day. If I am, this is another one I do really, really well with. If I am spooning and I go split grip, I want a split grip that is a very smooth transition. 
and then I don't have any issues. Again, this is just a, a more budget friendly combo that I caught a ton of fish on this fall as I've been experimenting and looking for more rods. This is a 7.6 medium heavy from 13. That's paired to a Corrado DC, but again, straight 20 pound fluoro. So all in all, you want a longer stout rod, 7.4, 7.6, 7.2, and you wanna stick them and then just horse on them to get those spoon fish out. Now, one thing about spooning, the warmer the water, the more aggressive I am with that spoon. Looks like you're out there trying to snag. You're not, but that's what it looks like. But the colder that water gets, again, this can be a reaction bite or it can be a finesse bite. I'll get all the way down to where I'm taking that spoon and I'm just rod tip bumping it. And it's literally flip-flopping on the bottom. That's all it's doing. Everybody else, somewhere in between. So I start out with those big spoon moves. Then I get down to where I'm just hopping that thing. And then I get down to where I'm just flicking that thing. The colder we get into winter. You have to experiment to find the right deal for you. But again, these are reaction techniques that lets you reach fish at depths where no other reaction techniques can reach them. We're effectively targeting those fish in deep water and still drawing reaction strikes. Now, why does a spoon with this crazy flutter work? Like, why do I need to worry about the color in my Kitek, but then I can throw a bright chartreuse one and three quarter ounce hunk of lead and catch a bass? It makes no sense, right? These look a lot better than we think they look. In winter, as the water is getting cold, every time you have a cold snap, you'll have a shad die off. Sometimes it's a major die off, sometimes it's minor, but the shad do not do well with the cold. And when they're dying, they're fluttering to bottom. It truly does look like a spoon. And then the spoon is falling so quickly with so much movement that they're not they're not tailing the Kitek staring at it, right? This is flying past them and they're reacting. So those bright, bold colors help them see it, lock into it and get it before it's gone. Same deal with that straight chrome. I love this like mirrored color. That's probably my favorite color. There's a ton of flash and clear water. I like all that flash. It's the same exact concept. It's throwing light farther and helping them key in on it. But whether we're talking spoons, blade baits, tail spins, metal baits should be a major part of your fall to winter transition. They will help you catch fish from up on the bank to bluff walls, to offshore structure in deep water and everywhere in between. These baits work this time of year and the vast majority of anglers around you are failing to use them effectively. And if you figure it out, you're fishing for fish that nobody else is targeting. Guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and we'll talk to you soon.